clip from Tid's Linian podcast, don't forget to subscribe. And so then there was the question, so how many cars are there in the global transport fleet? And this is interesting. I, no one had done that. As in, there, there, were, there were studies for the United States and there were studies for Europe and there were studies for China, but I couldn't find anyone to describe the global network. I, I think there was one, one guesstimate that was done in the year 2000 that I found that was, was out of date and I had to do it. So I found myself, you know, trying to assemble it myself and I assembled it like a, you know, uh, um, and, and, and news articles and, and I went through it. And so it's, it's not perfect, but I came up with 1.4 billion cars travel and, and then there's the estimate of how what much distance do they travel yeah and uh, it's cars it's both uh, fossil fuel cars and electric all cars. cars all, okay, all, all cars, cars all transport and so passenger cars uh, um uh passenger cars trucks uh, buses trucks vans um but then we also moved into trains uh maritime maritime shipping aviation all of it had to be modeled yeah and every other study I came across, and this is why I left them all behind, really, is they'd really only done like one tiny fraction of that. But like in 2018 in particular, everyone was interested in passenger cars only. They wouldn't talk about trucks at the time. They certainly wouldn't talk about trains or shipping. That's sort of changed now. Uh, and the assumption was, um, even though it's 2018, it's six years ago now, and the assumption was the whole system was fossil fuel and the whole system was now being transferred out of fossil fuel. At the time, the electric vehicle transportation fleet was less than 1%. Okay. Right. And now, since then, that transportation fleet has grown quite a bit. So, you know, it, 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 it tells a story. Yeah. So would it, would it even be possible, I mean, all that uh, cars and transports and ships with today's uh, technologies and today's scale, I mean, we're 10 billion people, would it be possible to even replace those fossil fuel Cars or transports with electrical? I mean, is, is it even practically so it depends, possible? It depends, on, it depends on the vector we use, like what direction we go in. Okay. If we are going to go in the direction of... See, for, for the last 150 years, we have built the system that's around us now with the most dense energy energy source the world has ever known. That's oil. Um, but oil, gas, and coal are extraordinarily dense, concentrated pieces of systems of energy compared to the more dispersed systems like wind and solar. Uh, so we've, we've built this system. It, there's been cheap, abundant energy. There's been cheap, abundant raw materials. And there's been easy to get credit compared to where we are now and where we're going. And now the system is so large, whereas if we were to start, say, a century ago, the system was much smaller. So the, so the problem is the scale of the task in front of us is enormous, much larger than conventional thinking will allow. Uh, and um, is it possible? The problem is what we are trying to replace it with, uh, with relatively exotic materials and using energy systems that are not as effective and as flexible as what we've got now. And so there's all sorts of bottlenecks and, and problems to, to do, to, to, to overcome, to move forward. I don't think... Um, the simple answer is no, if we were to do it the way we think we're going to do it. But human innovation is a thing. What might we do instead? So, but the purpose of this work was to show that the existing plan, as put out by senior strategic planners in the Western world, is not going to work, and if we go down this path, we're going to exhaust ourselves and waste time we don't have. Okay. And what what's that current plan, if we can summarize it somehow? Okay, so, so it's, it's colloquially called the Green Transition, or sometimes the Green New Deal. It's all fossil fuel systems will be phased out. All transportation, which was petroleum-fueled internal combustion engine, is now electric vehicles um, or a hydrogen fuel cell. And now we've got uh, things like ammonia fuel has now been considered. Um, or biofuels, that's the other one. The power generation, which is mostly you know, mostly coal, but then you've got gas and then a little bit of oil, is all phased out. And in its replace, in its place, we've got um, renewable non-fossil fuel systems. And they are nuclear, hydro, wind and solar, geothermal, biomass to waste. Where wind and solar take out 70% or more, no, 76% actually, of the gen in energy mix, as in they become the primary energy sources for the next industrial 
human civilization. And they're all weather dependent, actually. They're very weather dependent, yeah. highly intermittent, highly, highly intermittent. But isn't uh, that already like a really like stupid way to to use as a base if it's weather well, dependent? The, the 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 problem is our society has become very ideological. Yeah. Right. So it, 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 there, was a, there was a fundamental turning point in the late sixties, early seventies, where society um, decided. Uh, it was, it was actually marked by when we decoupled from the gold standard and with the US dollar, which then everyone else used, that money now become virtual and money was actually the, the metric that ran everything. It was the centerpiece that ran, ran all, other, all other systems. And then that meant um, if we wanted to do something, we just printed more money and we did. And so what set in was the idea that we didn't have to actually consider physical reality. And what we thought and what we felt was more important than physical reality. So here we are. Uh, fossil fuels are considered bad. Okay. Uh, what's considered ethical is what's called renewables. And the reason we like renewables is the sun shines and it's infinite, and the wind blows and it's infinite. It, it will never stop. Right. But the people who the, the world we're actually in in the moment is also different as 50, 60 years ago, every continent had the entire value chain for everything, more or less everything, from extraction of raw materials to all the way to manufacture, to growing of food, handling of waste. Everything was replicated everywhere else. And so everyone could see the whole value chain. Now we're in an era of globalism yeah. where uh, things are very centralized. Now, here in Europe, we, um, we don't like to... Mining's considered unclean. You know, uh, mining's considered unenvironmental. We don't mine. We will not accept mining. But what we do do is buy things off the market. So mm. it's, it's, it's like saying, you know, where does milk come from? Oh, the supermarket. Yeah. It, it's, that, it's that kind of uh, thing. Yeah. So, so what, what's happened is... The people who now lead us in, in these areas at a fundamental level, even though they intellectually understand that every physical thing has actually sort of come from a, uh, a mining operation and a smelting operation and a manufacturing operation, um, they go, oh, that's someone else's problem. Yeah. Right? It's, it's not part of the thinking. 